Hello, hello. Uh, Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, this is Berea Church. It's our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we just thank the Lord for keeping us for another week. Thank you for His goodness and His grace. Uh, thank you for all His mercy. Thank you for all He does. All our blessings. Amen. Uh, we just trust that uh, you're enjoying your time either at home or some of us still working. Uh, but we thank God. You know, we understand that it's the Word of God that brings light into the heart. So we like to share a little bit of the word, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, or if you want to just tune in, uh, I'm going to be reading Philemon 1 in the New Testament. It's uh, one of the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, and I will explain a little bit of the text and see how that applies to us today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, Consider, consider Onesimus. Consider Onesimus. Uh, Philemon 1 reads, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear brother and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Uh, that's interesting, because a lot of us are meeting in our home. Grace and peace to you. Uh, that's a similar and common address for the Apostle Paul. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God, my God, as I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear about your, your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be whole, bold, and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer you to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will not seem forced, but be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have, uh, you might have him back forever. And no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Uh, he is very dear to me but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me very your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord, but refresh my heart in Christ, confidence in your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you uh, in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark. Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. 
we just thank you for an opportunity to minister. We ask that you bless the word tonight. We know you're faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Consider Onesimus. Consider Onesimus. Uh, Paul's letter to Philemon is the shortest of his 13 epistles. Uh, it is to a man named Philemon uh, as titled written to him directly uh, and he is a well-to-do Christian uh, who resided in the Colossi Valley. Uh, Paul had been the principal agent uh, for the man's salvation uh, during his ministry in Ephesus and all of us can attribute anyone who has salvation can contribute their salvation to, to a human, someone who ministered the gospel to him. It may have been a long time ago, but somebody told you about the saving grace of Jesus. Uh, so Paul is speaking on behalf, as he mentioned uh, in 1 Corinthians, I believe, that although you have a thousand instructors or teachers, you only have one father. Only one person uh, brought you the message of the gospel. And Philemon is that person who delivered the gospel message to Paul. Or that Paul delivered uh, this message to Philemon uh, of grace. Okay, uh, the backdrop of this letter is first century Rome, the Roman Empire, and there were many slaves throughout the Roman Empire, and many sl slave holders had up to ten slaves, and some sla some slave holders had hundreds of slaves. Okay. Um, the the slaves were not a particular particular nationality or or race. You know, when we think about slavery, most of us right away think uh, about the African slave trade. But but the slaves in the first century were not any particular race or nationality. Uh, but they were composed of many conquered territories that Rome had conquered. Rome ruled the world. Uh, Roman law was not in favor of a slave. Uh, they could be bought and they could be sold. Uh, but, but the whole tenor of the letter is that Paul has bidding on the behalf of this man, young man, uh, Onesimus, who has ran away uh, from his slave owner, or slave holder, and apparently he's stolen something. Paul is pleading with Philemon to consider Onesimus, a, a lawbreaker, someone who, who, who has transgressed and done wrong, and, and under the law, it's going to be trouble for Onesimus. And, and, and what we find is that the gospel is alive in every book of the Bible. That, that's what I love about it. So, so what we find in Philemon is, is Paul is playing the role, really, of our intercessor, Jesus Christ, who goes in our stead and pleads um, our case to the Father. He's pled that case. He bled that case. And he suffered and died for our sins. We are Onesimus. Uh, we are whom uh, God the Father had to consider. And how did, what did he consider? He, he considered we were sinners. Rightly, uh, justifiably punishable under law. Under what law? Under God's righteous moral law. Lawbreakers. Sinners is what we are. And, and as God, the Father, stands in judgment, we see Jesus as, as the Apostle Paul. Jesus, the Son of God, comes in and pleads our case. He, he becomes our substitute through, through the, the gospel message. And the, and the gospel of grace, he purchases us back. And Paul says that, that Onesimus, and I believe his name means profitable, he said once he wasn't profitable, but now he's profitable. Uh, how many of you can say that before Christ saved you, you wasn't as profitable as you are now? And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the, the Holy Spirit indwelling your life, the peace that you have, the joy that you have, uh, the comfort that you have, knowing that your future is secure. Okay? 
consider Onesimus. Uh, that's the plea. That, that's the cry from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to the Father. Consider these sinners. Well, why? They don't have any return on investment. There's nothing good I can get out of them. But yet Christ went to the cross and died for us. You know, he went in our stead and, 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 and saved us, pled our case. And the Bible says he's become our great high priest. Uh, no need for another sacrifice. Jesus paid it all. Uh, Old Testament and even New Testament uh, slavery uh, in the first century uh, was not based on culture. American slave trade, where, where Europeans brought, bought African slaves and, and even African slaves sold other African slaves, it, the first century of slavery was not that, that debaucherous, demented, uh, 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 inhumane slavery. Uh, a lot of people, when they read the Bible and they find out the slaves uh, were a part of, of culture, really, uh, they run from the Bible or they don't really understand it. Okay? Uh, but Moses did not institute slavery in any shape or form. Uh, the Bible comes along uh, on purpose to repress slavery, to confine it within very narrow bounds, and to ultimately put an end to it. Okay? That's Charles Spurgeon. Uh, the slavery uh, that exists in the first empire was drastically different than the slavery that matriculated down through time to the United States of America. Um, the world uh, in the days of Christ was wrapped around the Mediterranean Sea, so, so there was no America uh, as we knew it. Okay? Um, in many cases, a man could sell himself into slavery, and he did. Uh, so slavery, again, two-thirds of the world was slave. Uh, slavery was, was a form, uh, a, a provision for a man. You know, if you didn't have a great trade or you didn't have a rich family, you was a slave. And, and you went a service and, you, and you, you got food and you got the clothes that you needed and you got shelter. Okay? Uh, Paul comes along and he wants to address these things. Uh, tr slaves in the old days were treated with respect. Per their, they could purchase their freedom at the age of 30. Uh, Paul provides instruction for both slaves and masters in his epistles. Uh, when you're reading the Bible, this is not the, a case for uh, us to have modern-day slaves. It was a different time. But yet God's word is able to govern every age, and, and he's relevant in every generation. That's the great thing about the Bible. His word is relevant in 2020. A lot of people don't want to have nothing to do with it, but it's relevant. Okay? It's relevant. Colossians 3.22 says, uh, Slaves, obey your masters on earth with a sincere heart. Uh, you're working for him. Uh, this is your boss. Do so with a sincere heart, okay? Uh, we ought to have the same attitude uh, for our bosses. And then he turns around and says, Masters, give your servants that which is just, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Uh, so the, the call is not just to the slave or to the worker, but also to the boss. Uh, you're going to get it one day, rest assured. Because we all have someone to be accountable to. Uh, slaves in that time served with a, a sense of a blessing. And, and uh, Paul's letter is not hinting any uprising or, or inciting a riot or anything for this slave that has uh, ran away. Okay? But uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 7 and 17 through 24, he says, if you have an opportunity as a slave to become free, take it. Okay? Uh, again, a, a slave could, 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 could take that option at the end of a servitude and live as a free person. I don't know how good employment would be. 
uh, but they can live as a free person. And he, and he tells us in seven, First Corinthians 7, 17, take it if it's there. If you want it, take it. Uh, he was commenting on the condition that existed in society at that time. Uh, his approach to his the, the, to this social evil was not to start a movement uh, when you see him writing and, and nor to incite violence or to overthrow the established order of things, but rather to, he wanted to work through the church to provide God's word and God's will on this issue of slavery. Okay. Um, often today in our society, we want sweeping new legislation. Uh, we want to get rid of whoever is in office uh, when we don't approve of things that we don't like, uh, uh, that we want immediate change. But, but however, f from a biblical perspective, uh, on a very hard issue, God is not using politics, come on people, as a means of bringing about change. If there's one thing you can be honest and say, political people, is that it hasn't worked well to address the problems of society. Uh, so God's word comes along and tells us what God has established as the form of behavior for peace. Uh, in the early church, there was uh, no established difference between a slave and a master. Everyone sit in the same assembly. And, and today, uh, some pastors and saints, their allegiances run along a narrow line of social economical status. Now, we ain't sitting together in church if you ain't driving what I'm driving and if you don't live where I live. But that wasn't the case in the early church. You know, uh, one pastor said, I believe it may have been, I better not quote it, but he said, uh, 11 a.m. is the most seg on Sunday is the most segregated hour in this country. Uh, the place where you see the great racial divide is every Sunday morning in your church. <laughs> Invite somebody that don't look like you to church. Okay. Uh, again, uh, slaves and masters establish no difference difference in church. Everyone sat together. Okay. Uh, the the early church gave a clear signal of how God sees you and how God sees us. All the same. Okay. All the same. Slaves could be elders. They could be teachers. Okay. Um, a slave didn't have money, uh, didn't have a lot of, uh, of tangible things, didn't have a lot of equity, could be teaching a master because God's gifts are like that. Uh, he, he blesses one and, and he blesses another. And he's not doing it along the line of how much money you have or even how good you are. But he has distributed these gifts according to how he feels, according to the, to the stature of the fullness of Christ, as they say in, in Ephesians. Okay? According to Ignatius, a first century bishop, church funds were used to buy the freedom of slaves. You know, they would take the tithing or the giving of that day, they would use it to buy the freedom of slaves. I, I can imagine pastors taking his money down to a to a, a, a place or to a plant, uh, they didn't have plantations, but I guess, but but to a slaveholder's house. Now, I would like to buy such and such that maybe knowing that that person has been abused or they have a relative that they would like to spend more time with, but purchasing that, purchasing that person's freedom. Uh, among slaves, they, their marriages were protected. Uh, you came out of service with the same thing you went in with if you had wife. You came out with a wife. If you had kids, you, you came out with the kids, if you wanted them, I guess. Um, early Christians ur urged non-Christians to free their slaves. That's the truth. Uh, that was the working of the Holy Spirit in the early church. So, so beginning with Paul and other apostles and teachers, a campaign of teaching 
uh, exhortation examples of, of setting um, these slaves free and the equal status given to them in the church. Uh, slavery eventually died out in the Roman Empire. Uh, so it was the impetus of the church, not politics, that ended slavery in the Roman Empire, and I'm convinced that it was the work of the Holy Spirit that ended slavery in this country. Uh, somebody said it was the Emancipation Proclamation, but it, it took more than politics. Someone had to be convicted about something they knew was wrong. And today, Christians who are, who are devout politicians, most of them don't have any godly conviction. I'm just telling you the truth. That, that's that been my experience, you know. Uh, they put God here and politics here. So we got to always make sure God is here and then politics is always derived from the God I serve and the word that he's given. Okay? Paul's in a Roman prison writing this, pleading on the behalf of Onesimus. Consider Onesimus. He, he's waiting a trial. You know, how many of you could be awaiting a trial that, that could end in death and plead the case of somebody else? You know, it, it takes a lot, of, it takes a great spiritual, spiritually mature person to be in a bad situation yet plead someone else's case. Uh, he was not. Uh, attached to a ball and chain. Uh, history tells us uh, he had his own quarters. He was sort of like house arrest. I guess he would be a lot like many of us are today in quarantine, except you that are out here running around. <laughs> uh, he had his own quarters. Uh, he was basically on house arrest. Uh, prior, prior to being on house arrest in Rome, he had been ministering in the city of Ephesus. Okay? And the Bible has a lot to say about Ephesus. And he meets this wealthy man named Philemon and his, and his slave Onesimus. And later, Philemon moved and returned to the Colossae Valley where he was a member of the church. But, but at some point, Onesimus, the servant, he runs away to Rome. And the text, text suggests, because Paul said, I'll pay back whatever he took, that he stole some stuff. You know, it's a rough thing, not just to have a servant, but to have someone in your house who steals. You know, and that's a rough thing. Bring them in, feed them, be good to them, and then they steal. So, so Philemon, Christian or not, is not happy about what has transpired. And, and under the law, he has the right to convict and, and have uh, Onesimus extradited on back. and. I don't think it was outside of their authority to, to maybe lay hold of beating on them. Okay. Uh, but while Paul is, uh, while he's there, uh, Philemon tells Paul about some false teaching. So, so uh, Paul writes in, while he's locked up, a lot of people run back and tell the pastor on people. Uh, so he, I, he really wasn't telling on other saints, but he was telling on these false prophets. Okay, uh, but while he's there, he writes to the Philippians and he thanks them for their gift. Okay, he writes to the Coloss the church in Coloss. He addresses heresy. So when we read Colossians, he's addressing heresy. Remember, he, he says, uh, um, uh, "What's the text? Two and eight. Don't let anyone deceive you through vain deceit and through philosophy after the rudiment of the world." and the tradition, traditions of man, but not after Christ, because in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, and you are complete in him. He addresses the issue of fullness. Uh, there were false teachers that were bringing all these egregious laws, and you have to do this, you have to do that, you need to do that. And isn't it funny that that's what they do today? Uh, they still try to tell you, i got to do this, look, either I'm free or I'm not. I knew I was a mess when I got saved. Okay? Uh, but if I'm free, I'm free. So, so he comes back in Galatians and says, stand fast in the liberty that Christ has set you free and don't be entangled again to the yoke of bondage. Either he set you free 
and you're free or you're not free. Either it's grace or it's law. Either it's works or it's grace. You have to decide which one it is. Okay, so so Paul's addressing not uh, the personal issue, but, but false teachers who were promoting false doctrine. Okay, and, and while he's there, he writes this letter to Philemon. Okay, Ephesus. He wrote to Ephesus because they were had issues with unity and fellowship. Uh, well, you might say, what does all this stuff have to do with me, John? Well, why are you talking about slavery? And why are you talking about this guy going on our behalf? Well, be because Christ has went in our stead. Because he's went in our place. You know, uh, we were guilty. Guilty and are guilty today. That's the beauty of, of the gospel. Uh, that we have a sh assurance that Christ has been our substitute. That, that he pled our case. The Bible says even though he didn't want to go, he went. Uh, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Uh, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, Paul had said in his mind, I'm going to settle the debt, whatever it is. You know, he's saying, you know, I'm going to take care of this thing. And in the same way, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has paid the ultimate price for your sin, you know. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, everlasting life, you know. It, it, Paul comes and says, hey, I know this guy has messed up. I, I, he didn't deny any of the fact that it, and the problem with people today is they think they're in good shape because they have a 401k or because they have a nice car, a nice house. You know, not knowing they're, they're a poor and pitiful, as Revelation says, they're all these things because money has blocked their need for a savior. But Paul comes along and says, consider Onesimus. You know, consider Onesimus. Just as Christ has, has come to God the Father and says, consider John, you know, uh, consider Jim. I'm going to pay the price for his wrong. <laughs> you know, I I'm paying the price. It's going to be settled. Whatever is owed, Christ has paid. You know, that's the message. That's the whole gist of it, you know. The Bible says that Christ has died one time for all. You know, it says uh, if he died for all, that means all was dead. We was all in bad shape until Christ came and bled and gave his perfect sublime life. You know, God in the flesh. You know, you don't have to understand everything about salvation, but you ought to understand John 3, 16, that you are a sinner. And a righteous God has to deal with sin. Uh, what kind of righteous God? You know, they've got all these crazy uh, figures and Thor and all these crazy mythical gods. But, but a righteous God, in my mind, has to address the pervasive state of sin in life. Adulterers, liars, stealers, drunkards, uh, adulterers, all these things that we have been. Consider Onesimus. Lord, consider me. <laughs> consider Onesimus. Consider me. That's all I got. God bless you. That should be what you say to the day to the Lord. Consider me. C consider me a sinner. You know, because Christ has went in your stead. And he's paid the ultimate price. And each day we can come to him and say, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, Jesus is the bread of heaven that came down from glory. You know, John said that he dwelt among us. We beheld that glory as the only begotten of, of the Father, full of grace and truth. Man, Only one person has came as a miracle worker. How could he come and not be able to come to see if he's really from God? But yet he did. You know, why, how could he say he was from God if he couldn't raise the dead? And he did. How could he truly say he was God 
if he wasn't able to heal the sick, but he did. Turn water into wine, you know. Uh, but today, you know, c- consider Onesimus. Consider your state as a sinner. Because if you don't consider your state, the day might come where you don't have any more time. You know, the Bible has outlined salvation uh, in a timeline that God has put together. We don't know what the end is. We don't know when the end is. The only recourse we have is to be ready, you know, to be ready when Jesus comes, you know. Uh, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. God bless you. If when you give the best of your service, telling the world the Savior has come, you know the rest. We thank God for all he's done. Love you. God bless you. Consider Onesimus. Lord, consider me. All right. Honey, you're my baby. How do you feel? Yeah, and I'm still. This night. Don't serve us, telling the world. Let me kiss her. Come on, little non-reader. Come on, let's take a walk. Okay, where do you want to go?